Hello and welcome to this panel session. I'm Rachel Morrison and I'm an energy and climate editor at Bloomberg and I lead a team of reporters covering the energy transition in Europe. And I'm delighted to be here today with this esteemed panel. Um, we're going to kick off by introducing everybody. So first of all, we have Ingrid Hofen, who is a development economist with more than 30 years of international experience. She formerly served as um, World Bank Group Executive Director representing Germany and held various high level positions in the BMZ, which is the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And next we have Arunaba Ghosh, who is a public policy expert, author, columnist, and institution builder. He's the founder and CEO of the Council of, on Energy, Environment, and Water, which um, was a strategic partner in the G20 for India. And he's also been vice chair of developmental policy. Next, we have um, Mariana Heinrich, who is a director and member of the extended leadership group at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And we have Ma Jun, who is chairman and president of Hong Kong Green Finance Association. And he's also um, co-chaired the G20 and drafted the first set of Chinese green finance policies. And he's also had stints at Deutsche Bank and the IMF. So thank you all very much for joining me. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask to sort of set the scene is about a just transition. What does it look like? And is it really possible on a global scale? So perhaps we could start with Ingrid. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mariana, for, for having me. I think it's absolutely key that we really um, achieve a global and just energy transition, um, which means actually that we face down CO2 emissions quite faster than we are doing right now. And this is so key because energy security is linked with climate security. And nowadays, we are actually heading uh, towards a world where we are going to, to face more insecurity, more volatility, and actually more poverty due to uh, the climate crisis. So energy transition means that we decarbonize our societies and our economies. What does just mean? It has different meanings. First of all, that the North, I mean, the developed countries have to play their part by really doing the transition at home. Um, secondly, by providing the right support and framework conditions for other countries to join forces and to make sure that the transition at home can work properly. And thirdly, I think what we need is another type of really high-level partnerships um, where we learn from each other. I mean, Germany is undergoing a huge energy transition. We are phasing out of coal. There are stumbling blocks in the way, so we are, we are in the learning process. But at the same time, we see that other countries of the so-called Global South are doing the same. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see how do they achieve a win-win opportunity where they decarbonize the economy, but at the same time, they create new jobs in new industries that emerge through the ex extension of renewable energies or increasing energy efficiency in their um, um, economies. And thirdly, I mean, when you do the transition and of course this may be from time to time disruptive how do we actually create a protection shield for those that may need more support training capacity building and what kind of actually security system to you build up in order to make this transition the transition where nobody has been left behind so three pillars actually doing the homework in the north, secondly, um, providing actually the right support in, in view of technology, finance, capacity building, and thirdly, fair partnerships where you really create a level of dialogue that is different from the one that we had in the past and takes fully into account the departing point from which actually countries start the energy transition. And if you work with Pakistan, this is quite different than working, for instance, with South Africa on a gen, jet, um, just energy transition. The problems are different, um, the ecosystems are different, and the requirements and the level of ambition may, may be different. But what actually is absolutely key and center, it has to be people-centered, and you have to make sure that the transition creates win-win opportunities for those economies. Mm -hmm. Do, would you agree? I mean, do you think that that people are at the heart of how you kind of make this global? 
My response would be, it's certainly possible, but it is not happening. <laughs> um, in 2010, when I set up CEW, India had less than 20 megawatts of solar. Today, it has nearly 180,000 megawatts of non-fossil electricity capacity and will be the first major economy that by the end of this decade will build more clean energy infrastructure than, exist, than its entire electricity system existed um, at the beginning of the decade. So in terms of emerging economies like India pushing the clean energy transition, um, that's certainly the case. Along with that, there is certainly a huge jobs opportunity. By the end of this decade, we'll have a workforce of over a million people uh, in, these, in these sectors. So when we think of the mantra of jobs, growth, and sustainability, it's something that is already being demonstrated. But what's not happening? What's not happening is we are not getting the scale of investment at the cost that is needed uh, in order for it to be genuinely just. Um, what's also not happening is that we are not co-developing technologies. We are waiting around whether technology will get transferred or not. So if we take these two critical pillars of the scale and cost of finance at one end and the, and the co-creation of, of technologies, which gives the, the very economies that will drive global growth and global energy growth, a stake in that clean energy future, uh, unless that happens, the, the transition will indeed occur, but might not end up being very just. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I saw you nodding along a lot there. Is that sort of in line with your view as well? Yes, it is. So thank you very much for having me firstly. So um, I, I completely agree with that because what I think we see at the World Business Council is that we're looking at very systemic problems. It, and, and what it seems like we've done very well in the, in, in the past until this date is that we've got this clock wheel of things that needs to change. And so, forth, so far, we've been good at changing individual pieces, like you just outlined. Some things in India are working well, but some things are not working well at all. And I think that's where um, we have to fully acknowledge that we're looking at very broad system transformation, and nothing works without energy. Um, that's simply a fact. So hence, like, we're looking effectively at making an economy moving from being fossil fuel based to a low carbon economy. So that then touches up on not only like the technologies and the fuels that you use, but it also touches on pollution, education, how to get it resilient for future weather events, adaptation. Uh, it's about population growth, catering for the future of others, um, and how do we actually at the same time protect nature and biodiversity. And I think that's where we're effectively looking at a scale of change that spans almost all of the economy, not only of a certain country, but of almost several regions at the same time. So we need that big sort of master plan. And actually, the NDCs were originally sort of outlining that master plan. Mm -hmm. The problem is they don't come with money. And hence, like, you know, that doesn't really, doesn't really lead to the change that we're looking for. So I think what's going to be very interesting to see unfold is the JetP in Australia, uh, in South Africa and Indonesia, because that has the money alongside with the change. Now, it's focused on one thing, fair enough, mm -hmm. but that could be a real example of how change is overall brought to an entire country, not only at the energy side, but also looking at the socioeconomic factors that will change it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I do agree. <laughs> And Marjun, do you think that China thinks a lot about um, a just energy transition? You know, there's a lot of pressure, obviously, on China when it comes to climate. Yeah, let me start with uh, Mr. Ghosh's comment on mm, we're not getting the scale of investment for transition and uh, the finance cost is too high. Now, this applies to both countries, especially developing countries, including China and uh, you know, lot the other South countries. The uh, problem is being addressed at the G20 level, as you mentioned in your introduction. I've been co-chairing the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, uh, actually until early this year. In the G20 Working Group, we discussed extensively on the topic of setting up a transition finance framework to address exactly that issue, how to get money <laughs> and cheap money mm. for transition activities and making sure these transition activities are just, meaning that they take care of the social consequences, especially in employment. Now, uh, just to sort of advertise a little bit of this document, uh, which we published in the G20 uh, in November last year, that was endorsed by the G20 leaders in Bali. 
And uh, this document is called G20 Transition Finance Framework, which includes uh, five pillars. I think it's, uh, in fact, a, a global consensus because we consolidate uh, the G7, G20, and many other uh, you know, NGOs' views. Number one, we need a definition of transition activities. Otherwise, we end up with a lot of transition wash. You know, a lot of fake transition activities will come from money. Number two, we need to make sure that disclosure of transition activities are properly designed and implemented, meaning that uh, these transition companies seeking financing needs to develop a transition plan, uh, which will include short-term, medium-term, and long-term targets, and uh, with proper accounting you know, for carbon. The third element is uh, the range of products we need to put in to finance these transition activities, not just the debt financing instruments, which mm -hmm. we've been seeing in the last couple of years, sustainability linked bonds, loans, and so on, but more on equity. Yes. A lot of the um, transition companies actually are short of equity now because of very high leveraging ratio. They're unable to borrow uh, at a lower cost. That's why equity is important. Also, a lot of uh, uh, you know, de-risking facilities need to be put in place. The fourth element is about policies. We need to make sure that a lot of these transition activities currently, which are not financeable or bankable, will become bankable. And that's why, you know, government tax policy, subsidies, uh, low-cost financing from a central bank, and uh, other policies at sectoral level need to be put in place as a package to help these transition activities become bankable. And finally, it's a just element. I know uh, most people, even in the G20 discussion, they believe that the the just thing is the responsibility of the government. The government needs to take care of the employment situation, by social security system and so on, but that doesn't work in most developing countries. The government simply doesn't have the fiscal capacity. That's why we in the G20 working group ask the finance sector to play a role, mm -hmm. to make sure the transition activities are just uh, in the form of, for example, ensuring the uh, potential unemployment resulting from the transition will be partially taken care of by the finances. For example, the finance can encourage the uh, companies in transition to develop uh, schemes to mitigate these negative impact on employment, for example, developing reskilling and retraining program and awarding these companies with lower cost of financing. Mm -hmm. So that's a setup I think we, uh, uh, we should be uh, you know, working towards. In China, we started this transition finance framework in implementation already. One and a half years ago, the central bank began to develop a set of activities which are considered as you know, uh, credible transition activities in the taxonomy. And the uh, second thing is uh, we are putting into the local pilots of green finance. And one of the local pilot program actually came up with incentives to make these uh, you know, transition uh, companies more bankable. So I think some of these uh, will be needed, uh, not just in China, but also globally. Mm -hmm. And so do you think it's, it's about setting a standard? Because, you know, as we mentioned, countries sort of do their own thing, maybe finance the transition in a way that they see fit and that it's appropriate for each country. You know, particularly Europe has a very European approach. I was looking before at um, some of the ideas that, um, you know, there's a fund for the transition, which is to make sure that all of Europe kind of moves together. But how do you do that so that other countries move as well? Is it a sort of climate diplomacy thing? Do we need a set of standards that all countries must um, promise to adhere to? You know, how do you see those kind of sharing practices happening? Um, this is exactly the role of the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, which uh, is designed to coordinate the efforts of a lot of international organizations and the country authorities in setting uh, their uh, approach, principles, standards, requirements for sustainable finance. Uh, let me give you two examples. <clears throat> Number one, we have too many definitions of green activities. Uh, there are probably 200 sets of taxonomies in the world. Some are coming from country authorities like uh, you know, China and Europe. Some come from NGOs. Some are done by the banks, asset managers, insurance companies. Now just imagine one community speaking two different languages. Communication will be very difficult, and it's costly for transaction and increase the risk of greenwashing. That's why an effort is done, in fact, between China and Europe to develop a common ground taxonomy. Uh, I was lucky to have the opportunity to co-chair this effort of IPSF Working Group on Taxonomy, which has developed two versions of common ground taxonomy, and that includes 72 
climate mitigation activities that's recognized both by China and EU, and it began to work. Uh, it facilitates green bond issuance um, uh, from Chinese entities selling to European other markets. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the second example is disclosure. Uh, there are at least dozens of disclosure standards or principles and the requirements on um, climate, on um, biodiversity, on um, pollution, and on um, many other things. And a lot of asset managers are confused. If they're managing a portfolio of 30 companies coming from 30 countries, uh, they're reporting you know, in many different standards. Again, transaction costs and also lack of quality uh, information become a bottleneck for system of finance uh, you know, globalization. And uh, that effort uh, <clears throat> Uh, of ISSP uh, is now being taken as endorsed by the G20 to address this on a global scale. I think it will be very powerful in you know, gradually converge the reporting standards and enhance the quality of the data to enable a lot of companies to obtain uh, system of finance at lower cost going forward. But if I could I come in yeah. on, uh, I think the standards uh, or at least coordination of standards is going to be a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for, again, justness, which mm -hmm. is the theme of this conversation. And why I say this is there are still uh, certain market failures that can't be solved by individual countries coming up with their standards. Uh, I will suggest two of them. Uh, one is that climate change, by its very nature, has nonlinear risks, um, which means that a tail risk today becomes normal in 2030, and an tail risk in 2030 becomes normal in 2040. That nature of nonlinearity makes it very hard to insure against such risks, mm -hmm. which means that the most vulnerable get impacted, not just the most here and now, but over time as well. We don't have a global insurance cushion for the most vulnerable. And every time they get slammed by one shock after another, it could be public health, it could be food, it could be energy, combined with climate change, these compounding shocks make it very hard for these economies, as much as they might want to put forward policies for, a energy, for an energy transition, they will not have the fiscal space or the economic resilience mm -hmm. to bounce back in a cleaner and better way. So this will not get solved simply by standards of what is green. This requires global coordination to have an insurance cushion. Another type of market failure is the risk perceptions. Nearly 90% of electricity demand will come from emerging economies. But you ask an institutional investor in London or in New York, are you going to invest there? They will say, well, only if it is OECD level of risk. Mm -hmm. Now, that's circular logic. If it was going to be OECD level of risk, that country would already be an OECD country. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to become an OECD country, you've got to invest in their infrastructure, sustainable or otherwise. And that means we need a globally coordinated mechanism to reduce the delta between real and perceived risks and reduce the cost of finance so that these economies and project developers within these economies are not buffeted by non-project shocks that they don't have any control mm -hmm. over. If the US Fed increases interest rates and their cost of finance goes up, it has nothing to do with their clean energy policies or their ambitions. It's a global coordination problem. Mm -hmm. So unless we solve for these global market failures, mm -hmm. the standards will again make, you know, it'll be that carrot that's dangling right in front of you, but you can't seem to grab it because mm -hmm. the money still does not flow where the sun shines the most. Ingrid, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, with, with, with pleasure. Actually, I, I wanted to um, also un underline that actually this type of systemic energy transformation that has to happen takes place in a moment that is characterized from very, very difficult conditions. You have just described it. We are facing in, in all parts of the world, but especially so-called global south, um, the impact of multiple crises. Still, the economies are weak because they're coming out of COVID-19 pandemic with all the economic and social impact that it had. Um, additionally, the climate crisis is already very obvious, and the biggest impact is in many very poor developing countries. And there is no cushion, there is no safety net at the global level to deal with this, um, these um, issues. So one has to figure out, and of course, countries have, are very indebted. I mean, IMF has recently again published a report describing how many countries are at risk, really, um, of failing to, to fulfill their, um, their payment obligations. And this, of course, 
means that they have a shrinking space for, uh, for budgetary resources that they can invest by their own. And fourthly, I mean, even, I mean, very renowned economists say, look, the big transformation can't be done only with market from the private sector or from, from capital markets. It's in, in, in many cases, it's too costly. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with the de-risking unless we are sufficiently bold in establishing the right mechanisms to deal with those, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. We have observed this over the last 15 years. We have actually overestimated the risk appetite also of the private sector, quite frankly, this is actually has been underlined by the chief economist of the World Bank, so it's not my analysis. So how do we deal with this? And fifthly, I think it's also to think about institutions. I mean, a transformation of this magnitude, it's not simply like changing one policy. Mm -hmm. you, you need a type of setting of working together, government, private sector, the society, at the local level. You have to think about the right regulatory framework also at home and to make sure that all those involved have the sufficient knowledge and skills what this transformation is about and what kind of opportunities are embedded. And this is, I mean, we face this here in, in Europe and Germany as well. Mm -hmm. That's not an easy take to accomplish and to bring across a message that even if the, perhaps the pathway is a bit stony, but at the end, it's so much better because it, it actually safeguards not only our planet, but also our livelihoods and our human security at, at large. So I would like to underline that one has, when we speak about the energy security situation, transformation, when we do this as practitioners, we always make sure that we see the overall framework we are operating in. And we make a plea that the general conditions that many, many partner countries are facing, indebtedness, um, poor economic uh, prospects right now, and very limited access to the capital markets, that this has been taken into account when we now create new mechanisms. And when I speak about new mechanisms, it's not only about de-risking, as has been said, and the right policy regulations, but we also have to be very bold in assuring that we create the global safety nets, insurance schemes, global shields that are needed in order to create the buffers that yeah. countries um, need when they face, I mean, very, very big crisis like in Pakistan when extreme weather events can actually harm many, many, not only people, but actually economies. Mm -hmm. And it takes so much time then for them really to build back better. Um, it's easily said, but it takes uh, really a lot of support, coordinated support. And nowadays, we are starting to create the solutions. I think we are on the way. We are not yet there. I mean, solutions such as the Global Shield, the loss and damage financing mechanism, um, the Barbados plan that has been promoted by, by Prime Minister Motley. So there are a lot of actually good proposals on the table. And I think in order, if you want to achieve really a dark, decarbonized economy and society, we also have to deal with the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I could just put a number on it for you that my colleagues at Bloomberg New Energy Finance estimate that to get on track for global net zero, um, investments in the transition and grids need to average $4.5 trillion dollars between 2023 and 2030, which is more than three times the total spent in 2022. So perhaps, Mariana, you, you mean that's a huge number. Do you think that's possible? And what's the sort of role between public and private um, finance in achieving that? That is a huge number. And um, actually, the, I often use a, a number from Bloomberg um, New Energy Finance, which um, looks at how much investment is required either in green or, or networks against like fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And they come out with this ratio of four to one. So basically that's what we're aiming for in 2030. It needs to be on an average global basis, um, four to one. Uh, we're nowhere close to that right now. We're at roughly 0 0.9 to one, um, something like that. Um, so that gives us the scale of, of the problem in, in monetary figures. Um, I think I look at this from a business perspective because the World Business Council works with over 220 big global multinational companies. So business is usually the fastest agent of change. 
So, you know, if you really want to have a system like Flip, like if we look at how, how fast did everybody have an iPhone, um, you know, that's what business can do when it's working really, really well. So the question is, how do, you, how do you create the conditions for business to actually do that in this context? And of course, that's difficult. I think they all want to because they want to invest in the global south, they want to invest in the energy transition. It's just really hard for them to find those opportunities because it is a future growth market for them. That's like, you know, everything, everything in Asia, everything, like everything is moving east, right, and, and south, so to say. Um, what business, I think, can bring to that is they, many companies have become very good looking at the high standards that they can set for social and environmental performance. And so by companies coming into countries, um, they can help with raising the bars um, for overall sustainability, but specifically social, social performance. Um, for example, by abiding by the UN uh, guiding principles um, uh, for human business and human rights. Um, and that's one of the um, first things that we actually set out um, for a business agenda um, in the equity space, and, and um, well, we could call it equity inequality. Um, but I think for many, many, many years, it was unclear what is the role of business of addressing that just problem. And of course, it's also a very fastly evolving space because sustainability has changed so much, even in just in the last two, three years. So we set out and tried to say, okay, so if you are a company and you're serious about your socio, socio impacts, um, and particularly if you're working um, in, a, in a global south setting, um, then what are the 10 action points of what you can do? And we just... Um, looked at that, or published actually, our sort of 10 action point agenda um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so available for everybody to download, not behind a paywall in any manner. Um, it's called, it's actually done by the Business Commission to tackle inequality. So business leaders who care about how to tackle inequality, particularly in the global south. So I think the role of business has been controversial, right? No, no question about that. Um, but I think we can use business better in those circumstances going forward because they are that clear an agent of change that can make whatever deployment we're looking at a lot faster. What about scope three emissions as a kind Ooh. of measure for business <laughs> and how serious <laughs> they are? Yeah. So, um, well, scope three emissions really depend on which sector you look at, right? So, like, you know, some, some sectors don't have a lot of scope three emissions. For others, it's a huge question mark. Um, now, <laughs> especially for banks, <laughs> especially for banks. Yeah, exactly. No, complete good point. And, and they're struggling so much with the framework of how do they actually decide where do they invest? Because actually, I was talking to a bank the other day and they were telling me it's clear to them that investing in a coal plant in Netherlands is not OK. Everybody knows that. Um, but how do you look, for example, at a gas plant somewhere in Asia or in South Africa? Maybe that's actually a good investment because it would help it will help emissions to come down over time, but they're puzzled on that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, side <laughs> point. Um, but I mean, scope three, yeah. Um, it's, a huge, it's a huge problem for many companies in terms of the, um, how do they measure it and how do they take accountability for those emissions. And um, we are trying to build a universal transparency platform that actually helps to address scope three emissions. Um, it's called PACT, P-A-C-T. Um, and, and that helps many sectors to work with their peers up and down supply chains to really look into how much emissions is there and how am I being accountable for that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we could talk a little bit about the role of fossil fuels and whether, you know, it's just too idealistic to think that we can go from dirty straight to clean and the role of gas in between and to the point that Mariana made that sometimes replacing coal with gas is better than coal um, and you know how do we I think in some of the, the uh, economies like China, like India, where, you know, it's, it's just not going to be clean immediately. How do we kind of um, view the role of fossil fuels? Are they, do they have a role in some places? Are we just going to hope CCS happens? Um, you know, can we speed that up? Because ideally we just wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have any um, gas with, with CCS. It would just be straight to clean. Um, I don't know who, who's got a, a view on that. 
Maybe uh, I'll say a few words on um, sort of the gradual changing attitude to, uh, within our community on the phasing out of fossil fuel, uh, especially in Asia, coal phasing out. I think a couple of years ago, there was virtually a consensus that uh, let's phase out them as quickly as possible. But uh, more recently, in the last couple of years, they began to realize if you phase out too quickly, uh, at some time, you end up with an energy crisis, power shortage. Uh, we actually had a two. Um, power shortage in China in the past two years. And uh, a lot of other Asian countries have the same problems. So this forces us to rethink whether there are other sort of packages of uh, uh, solutions <clears throat> that could more properly implement it to you know, engineer energy transition. For example, uh, in Asia, the age of coal-fired power generation facilities are much younger than that in Germany or you know, other European countries. If you face out uh, a uh, coal-fired power generation company that's already 30 years old, the residual value is zero, then it's much easier. But in some Asian countries, only 10 years, and there's still 20 years of residual value, and uh, you need to put in a lot of money to buy out that part of the residual value in order to face out. It's, so it's very costly. And secondly, you can actually use some of the existing uh, coal-fired power generation facility for uh, flexibility options uh, for for example, solar and wind, right? Given that uh, your colleague has been working on energy, they know that a lot. So not necessarily you know, uh, being completely phased out, but they are helping the energy transition uh, because renewable energy are not stable at this particular moment. And the one more idea is that uh, I think transition finance is probably more important than phasing out, uh, at least in some countries, some occasions. You need to help the carbon-intensive companies, especially including coal-fired power generation and uh, uh, the energy company to turn themselves gradually to a renewable company rather than closing them down mm -hmm. and uh, so that you can actually protect employment and these people can be retransferred you know, within the same company. So these are the couple of, I think, new trends that we need to you know, uh, pay attention to um, in, in this uh, debate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think one more thing we have to uh, consider in this, you know, again, to ensure that we don't you know, set this up as a binary. If you set it up as a binary, then there is no conversation. Right? Um, and, and, and as Marjun was saying, you know, depending on the structure of an economy and depending on the structure of their, you know, of their contributions to the global economy, there will be certain roles for different types of fuels. However, the real question we have to ask ourselves is, at the margin, are renewables winning versus fossil fuel? And if they're not, we've got to fix for that. In India, last six years and more, uh, investments in renewables are far outpacing investments in thermal power. Mm -hmm. right? Now, how do we double down on that, right? along with battery storage, etc.? Then there's the question of uh, between coal versus gas uh, versus any other fossil fuel, you know, what is that role? You know, if you take green hydrogen, for instance, you know, our a green hydrogen mission is the largest single country mission in the world. Uh, but right now, the cost of green hydrogen from pure green sources is over $4 a kilogram, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the price of turquoise hydrogen is about $1.5 a kilogram. Now, could we have a little bit of blending which actually triggers the future green hydrogen market rather than wait and lose an entire decade before you know, pure green hydrogen becomes viable? So I think you've got to go country by country. And then we need to think about, I mean, ultimately when we talk about net zero, uh, there's net before zero which means that there has to be some degree of removal mm -hmm. that has to be in our equations. So do we have, again, from a global solidarity perspective, the first phrase that Professor Snower used in the morning, right? Uh, do we have a global solidarity approach towards removals, towards carbon capture storage or whatever? I mean, I'm not cherry picking technologies, but that is what will make it just. Rather than saying one fuel is, you know, evil and another fuel is not evil, and because you're using one type of fuel, you're evil versus not. I mean, that kind of a binary conversation is simply not helpful. Mm -hmm. Ingrid. Well, Ben, I would like to depart from what science is telling us. Right now, we are heading towards a 2.8 degree world, which is actually, I mean, the scenarios are disastrous, especially for, for many countries. For instance, in, in Africa, we are observing tipping points already um, around the world, um, in the Amazon region, etc. And if you actually, if, if this continues, I mean, the type of impact that we're going to observe um, at the global scale 
is going to have a huge impact on migration economic activities. So in such a scenario, um, what again is being told um, is actually you have to phase out, you have to reduce CO2 emissions. And right now, the numbers of coal power plants already in existence, and this, I mean, relates to the north and to the south equally, is, is going to actually consume a big portion of the remaining CO2 budget worldwide, mm -hmm. which we all need in order to, to maintain economic activities and so forth. So in view of these numbers, um, the question is, how do we get, and the opportunities that we see in actually applying renewable energies, in, even in countries that a couple of years considered not middle-income countries, such as Kenya, they approach F100% real renewable energy, um, um, so to say production and consumption. The same applies for Chile, and they have a very ambitious program to use green hydrogen. So there are already best practices and showcases in the Global South that demonstrate it's doable. Mm -hmm. So instead of perhaps thinking, can I actually phase a bit, little bit slower? Do I use a bridge technology just as gas? Shouldn't we look into the options that we do have in order, as you said, to triple investments into renewable energy? They have been really on a steep curve over the last couple of years. Do we find options to de-risk actually financing in these sectors? Do we see options possibly to reduce fossil fuel subsidies that are still very huge worldwide and use um, these tax incomes for other purposes? So perhaps to focus much more of our attention to those options that are already out there. And we have already realized, even for instance, we are working in this sector together with all our bank in African countries, to resolve the issues of base load, of energy security, and with a combination of, of technologies, it's, it's really, it's rule doable. Mm -hmm. One has to think, I mean, if a coal fire um, plant is being substituted by gas right now, this is a 40 years investment. So the country has to be sure, I mean, this is really economically wise. Mm -hmm. and because the investor is going to stick to the plant as long as, as the living span is. And these are long-term investments. It's not, this is not a sprint. It's really then an investment for a marathon. And if there are other options, and there are other options in many, many um, partner countries, why shouldn't they actually go for these options that are in the longer term climate-friendly and more resilient and give them at the same time more energy independence because renewable energy can be produced at home, can be governed at home, can be steered at home. And if, I mean, the private sector, the global north would open up markets so that also production of what is necessary to, ex I mean, to increase the application of renewable energy can more forcefully take place in more countries of the global south, it's also an economic mm -hmm. opportunity. And um, I know that it's not easy to think about the transition, and I, I would agree it's not black or white, but I think we should, with a very, very cool blood, we should assess what is economically wise for developing countries. And certainly, we would make a plea not to go into bridge solution, but to go forcefully and follow the good examples, such as Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, to optimize actually the mix of renewable energy application for their own economies. Mm -hmm. It's going to pay off in the longer term. That's, that's what we see in our analysis. Yeah. Um, maybe in the final few minutes, we could take a couple of questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, yes, this lady here. Good afternoon. Uh, being a uh, 2018 global changer, I took uh, I participated here uh, at the summer school, how to change the world. And then I also participated at summer school at Oxford University Exeter College. There I was told and taught from my professors that Sydney and also in UK, there would be a disastrous flood and all things would be coming. The professor said to me at that time, you will be witnessing it. And we were, as students, wondering how would it be possible? It was 2019. Now, last year, I was 
uh, for an educational project in Pakistan. And I witnessed it myself. The hotel I was uh, staying in just collapsed uh, from the flood. So please, it's my request to you guys, take it seriously. As Mr. Ghosh said, it should be a global uh, uh, platform and global strategy that business people must take it more seriously. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, we have another one here. Thank you. Alexander Harlambos from Living Prospects, and thank to the panelists and the speakers for your insightful interventions. We heard about um, the fact that the climate change investments are probably not bankable. But I would like to pose the question, how about instead of working towards making these investments bankable, we work towards making the fossil fuel investments non-bankable? Because we have to think that these are bankable investments because somebody subsidizes them, and that somebody is future generations, so it's subsidies not decided by the future generations and actually designed by an old generation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have another one here, and I think that will be our final one, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you for our speeches. I'm from Latvia, and we are working for uh, climate uh, transition problems. I'm representing the political party uh, Growth, and uh, I would ask you how, you, how do you think, is it important the education and culture, culture of customization, culture of education? So the first step is the culture, culture of using the products of new economy. I think that it's our, the first First steps, we would start from the culture of learning, culture of using, and after that we will understand that no coal, no oil, but we need new technologies to save not only us, but the new generations. Thank you. Thank you. I think those statements sort of echo a lot of the points that have been made um, during this session. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your contributions. It's been really interesting.